everybody, and welcome to the Money Pop COVID-19 Daily Bulletin for Thursday, March 19th. I'm Kim Carly. We are having a new format now, which is going to bring you up to speed on some of the big news of the day and bring you insights from some very smart people as they navigate through what is happening right now in markets and personal finance. In a few moments, we're going to sit down with Bart Mellick on oil prices. He, of course, is the global head of commodity market strategy at TV Securities. Uh, oil is getting to levels we have not seen in 30 years, and before that, the 1940s, and we're seeing out west with Western Canadian flex being hit particularly hard. So we'll get to that conversation in just a second, but to bring you up to speed on some of the latest news, uh, the ECB the European Central Bank has announced massive uh, bond buying program, $814 billion to calm the markets and support the EU economy. China has reported no new domestic infections today, so a bit of positive. Alberta is to offer $572 uh, per week to citizens based on government criteria for self-isolation. Air Canada is gradually suspending its international service by March 31st. The New York Stock Exchange is closing its trading floor temporarily. It's shifting to electronic trading after positive coronavirus tests with some of their traders, GM, Ford, and Fiat Chrysler to close off Canadian and U.S. North American factories to March 30th. And Canadian Finance Minister Bill Monod is uh, saying there still is an option of further fiscal stimulus, which has not been taken off the table. And I'm going to have a little bit of good news in here. Uh, we actually are seeing some news of uh, dolphins swimming in the canals in Venice because there's less traffic there. So some interesting things happening on that front. And we're also seeing just out right now that the, the New York government has ordered 75% of non-essential workforce to stay home as their cases are surging to just about 4,000. A lot going on, changing by the moment. And as I mentioned, oil prices are at historic lows. So let's bring in Bart Malik to talk a bit about what's happening with oil prices right now. And Bart, I, and the last time we saw these levels of prices was, I mentioned, 30 years ago. Before that, you have to go back a long way to see this. So can you just give us some perspective on why we're seeing such a magnified collapse in oil prices right now? Well, certainly the big driver is the expectation of a collapse in demand over the next few months. Uh, social distancing in North America starts holding, uh, taking hold uh, as we're seeing airlines uh, being grounded. We're expecting a very large decrease in demand globally. In fact, we're estimating as much as 10, 11 million barrels over the next few months of lost demand, uh, possibly even more. And that essentially means that very rapidly we're going to have accumulation of inventory. And if the demand side wasn't bad enough, we had a falling out of Russia and Saudi Arabia. And what they did is, uh, what they didn't do essentially, is agree on a supply management uh, deal. In essence, uh, they were, we all thought, supposed to cut production in response to weaker demand. But what happened instead, uh, they got into a price war with Saudi Arabia not only not decreasing supply, they decided to burn the house down, as one would say, and ramp up production aggressively from just under 10 million barrels to possibly over 12 million barrels. This means we are going to have a very large inventory accumulation and possibly a lack of storage capacity in North America and globally. And this is why, in addition to all the volatility in the market, uh, in financial markets broadly, um, and the selling of equities and risk assets, we have this issue on top of it. And, and, and here we are. Prices right. of WPI very low. But let me jump in here because I mean, there's I mean, there's so many things to look at with this in terms of illiquid markets and volatility, which I will get to the financial aspect in just a second. But when you look at the supply overhang, uh, you know, you've got you mentioned that storage could become full, uh, and then you know, I've even heard some people talking about negative pricing as as you know, producers just need to find a way to offload some of this because there's just nowhere to put it. Uh, that certainly is a risk, and it's not unprecedented. We've seen something similar uh, to that in natural gas markets, where natural gas was negative priced. Uh, uh, we've seen some incidents in, in crude as well, but it was very, very unique circumstances. Uh, but this certainly is a possibility. These, we have to remember, are very much regulated commodities. You have to have particularly designed and approved storage facilities and 
if you have supply, you you know, you just may not be able to shut it off on a dime and you're going to have to put it somewhere. And then if the, you know, nobody wants it, you might have to incentivize someone to take it off your hands. So it's, it's very dire indeed, at least in the, the, the next few uh, little while. Let, let me ask you about, I mean, the hard part about this, of course, is I mean, the depth and breadth of, of how long this is going to last. So um, you, you mentioned dire for a little while. How long can we see the supply overhang last? Um, will this, you know, the drop in demand uh, shake up maybe the, the conversations between Saudi Arabia and Russia? I mean, and, and where, where do you see, you know, this unfolding over the next, you know, six months to a year? Uh, well, we recently published a, a piece uh, back, uh, yesterday trying to explore some of it, and we, we, we try to model this. And we're looking just fundamentally at a big decline in demand over the next um, several quarters. But unfortunately, we don't expect uh, any significant response on the supply side uh, quite yet. Um, Saudi Arabia has well over half a trillion dollars of funds that can be of foreign exchange. Uh, so does Russia. Um, and it looks like they want to significantly hurt the shale producers uh, because they've been taking their market share. And as OPEC was cutting, they were not. Um, we're imagining it has to take at least a quarter, maybe two quarters, for that to manifest in enough pressure to force capital expenditures to go to zero at the shale producers. Uh, we estimate that 90% of them will be, 80% at least, uh, will not be able to cover their all-in cost, and they will not all be able to cover cash costs, C1 costs, uh, maybe as much as 50% of the industry. But it will take time for them to actually reduce supply. They're not going to do it. Uh, voluntarily, they're going to want to get as much cash as possible. They're going to basically run out of resource as CapEx stops, and that may take a while. And Russia and Saudi Arabia are very much unlikely to do this unless they see evidence uh, that those shale producers are on a downward trajectory in production. So this could take a couple of quarters, I'm imagining. Hmm. Uh, let me ask you, uh, bring this local for a second in terms of Western Canadian Select. I mentioned yesterday uh, or that the pricing hit, I think, uh, a low of, I want to say, $7 and, and change, which was a jaw-droppingly low. Um, what, you know, Western Canada was already facing <laughs> its own challenges, uh, obviously, from the pricing. Um, do you have any sense of what could be happening with that pricing? Well, at least in the, the short run, it will continue to be under duress. The problem is um, uh, these markets uh, are going to be flooded with crude, and with all the social distancing we're seeing, is it's unlikely that we're going to see demand uh, uh, that that, uh, that you know for the refineries that use this uh, product to make uh, diesel to make gasoline. We've seen the uh, crack spreads collapse here, uh, meaning that there might not be demand for for this uh, crude. It's no longer uh, a capacity constraint. It is now a, a demand constraint and overhang of inventories um, uh, in the United States. So I'm afraid there's probably, um, you know, not a lot of reasons to think that this is going to bounce higher. It could very well be that governments in Canada are going to have to, again, restrict restrict supply uh, of this product to bring the prices up, as has been done by Alberta um, a while back, as you know. Let me ask you about the, the markets themselves uh, uh, in terms of, you know, there's are the markets feeling illiquid right now? Um, well, we're seeing a lot of volatility in everything, and oil is no exception. I mean, what are you seeing from the, the trading standpoint of oil? Well, volatility is huge. We've been reaching... Uh, record lovers, uh, when, when you, uh, uh, you know, when you adjust for the new methodologies for the VIX, it's even been higher than during the financial crisis. Um, and it means that a lot of uh, CTAs, a lot of uh, uh, other systematic funds, the algorithmic funds, where volatility is a big determinant of how they position, um, will reduce their exposure to all sorts of products. We're 
certainly seeing that in gold where it's seen to be as a hedge and people are selling it, not because uh, there's anything wrong fundamentally with it, that, but because volatility and selling for liquidity sake is driving uh, us there. So markets are very erratic, and it's very much a problem surrounding uncertainty. We, we, we don't know what the end game here is. We're not sure of what the fiscal side will be. Now we're finding out that all these massive stimulus programs from central banks, from the Federal Reserve, for example, uh, on the repo market, $5.5 trillion, they're backstopping, they're setting up new facilities, uh, as they did during the financial crisis to make sure that there is liquidity in the market. None of that has really helped. And fundamentally, the reason is, in, in my opinion, is we don't know how bad this COVID-19 situation is going to get and if we recover and if we'll have enough solvency on the corporate and individual side to to have a healthy environment um, that will get us into growth once the virus crisis passes. So a lot of uncertainty and a lot of it is on the policy side, and it is very much a health issue that central bank liquidity isn't going to help. Let me ask uh, my last question for you, Bart, and pre or Bart, appreciate the insight, but when you nobody has a crystal ball, uh, but when you look out you know, a year uh, and two, and I don't know if people have the capacity to do that right now, do you foresee structural changes that are happening because of what's happening today that could be in fact impacting oil markets in the future? I, I think so. Um, I think one major change will be that a lot of the high-cost swing producers that rely on constant capex uh, to keep them going will probably represent a smaller share of the market uh, than today. We have already a problem with attracting risk capital to um, uh, to oil companies of, of all sorts uh, because of environmental uh, concerns, because of decarbonization, decarbonization uh, issues, and that is already happening. Now that we have introduced yet another massive set of volatility and risk into this market, remember now you know an investor is going to have to consider uh, that we could see Saudi Arabia and other state players like the Russians. Uh, mess with the market and cause them harm, um, and we'll question the wisdom of sinking capital to high-cost producers like a lot of the shale um, and other non-conventional players like the oil sands uh, are. Uh, so we probably will get less growth and probably a smaller market share uh, than we have today. Art, great insights, and uh, do appreciate your time, and, and, and I'm sure it was a very busy time for you. Thanks so much. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Art Mellick, he's Global Head of Commodity Market Strategy at TD Securities, and that wraps up your Money Talk COVID-19 Daily Bulletin for today. Be well. <laughs>